The morning, Wednesday evening, Ronnie was punctual, fueled by curiosity since yesterday's phone call. She was familiar with the visitor only as a distant relative, their interactions limited to occasional family gatherings. The visitor's profession as a lawyer added layers to Ronnie's intrigue. Ronnie inquired with her husband, also a lawyer, about any professional acquaintance. Only remotely, he replied. She's from a different county, works solo, and juggles various cases to make ends meet, including family law. She's got a solid reputation, though. As Ronnie welcomed her into their home, she sensed the visitor's unease. After brief familial pleasantries, the visitor cut to the chase. Ronnie, Phil, I understand your confusion. Your father hired me two years back for a task. Phil, you're still his primary attorney, that's unchanged. The visitor, an elegant woman in her fifties, seemed on the verge of tears. This task was exceptionally challenging, but family obligations prevail, so I complied. I'll clarify everything with the DVDs I brought. The latest one was recorded recently, while the others are older. I'll stay to answer any questions after you watch them. It's best the kids aren't around tonight. She handed Phil a set of labeled discs and whispered something to him. He returned with water and tissues for everyone. Selecting a disc marked Veronica and Phil, Phil played it. Their father appeared on screen, smiling yet solemn. Ronnie, Phil, hello. Phil, my choosing Anne for this doesn't reflect on you. You'll understand soon, he began, pausing to compose himself. I've been under medical care for a while, but you don't know the full story. His pause, filled with visible emotion, left Ronnie with a deep sense of foreboding, having never seen her father so vulnerable. I have to be straightforward with you. Nearly two years back, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I initially visited the doctor due to depression, which I thought was causing my forgetfulness. You might not have noticed since it started off mild and I attributed it to aging. As it worsened, I reduced my visits, hoping it wouldn't be apparent. The medication provided relief for a while, but the condition progressed to the second stage. Now, I'm advised to give up driving and consider moving into a care facility. I've arranged for that, but there are things I need to clarify before I proceed. He paused, bowing his head momentarily before continuing. Ronnie's eyes welled up with tears. She had sensed something was wrong, but between managing her business, especially after tax season, and caring for their teenagers, she brushed aside her concerns, reassured by his claims of being fine. He then looked directly into the camera. Please don't be upset with me for communicating this way. I wanted to get it right, and this method helps me be clear. And I'm not going anywhere just yet. I expect our children to visit frequently while I still have my memories. He fixed his gaze on the camera, adding, When you and the kids visit, I have one request. If my condition deteriorates to where I no longer recognize you or can't communicate, please stop visiting. The idea of you facing what's left of me, without any recognition, is unbearable. I'd rather you remember the good times. He revealed a secret, I once asked for your DNA samples, claiming it was for genetic research. In truth, I was checking for Alzheimer's susceptibility. It's hereditary, and unfortunately, Ronnie, you're at risk. Phil, please ensure she gets regular checkups. With ongoing research, there's hope for better treatments. His voice betrayed his sorrow as he continued, Junior and Joy aren't at risk because they don't share my biology. In fact, they don't share the same father. I'm uncertain about Junior's paternity, but I believe Josh Randall is Joy's biological father. The recording was stopped as Ronnie was overwhelmed with emotion, crying into her husband's embrace, and joined them, also in tears. It took a long while for Ronnie to find her composure again. Should I go? Anne inquired softly, you can reach out to me later if you need to talk. Ronnie held her hands tightly. Stay, please. I'll definitely have loads of questions. How much of the video is left? About 30 minutes more for this one. There are personal messages for you, your siblings, each of your partners, and one for Joy's roommate. Plus, there's one for your mother. Are you ready to keep going? Ronnie nodded firmly, and they nestled back on the sofa while Phil resumed the playback. I was completely taken aback and hurt when I discovered this. It took me a while to process my feelings. Ultimately, regarding you kids, it made no difference. You are all my children, regardless. I nurtured you, cherished you, and will always be honored to be called your father. A few surprising revelations can't undo a lifetime of love. I hope they understand that too. However, Ronnie, even with my deep affection for you all, the truth did alter how I feel about your mother. I did some digging, wasn't pleased with what I found, and so I updated my will. You and Anne are in charge of executing the revised will I had Anne prepare. We aim to anticipate every possibility, but it's tricky. Ronnie, the fact that you're my biological child is irrelevant. I chose you because you've always been the resilient one. You're the one I trust to act honorably. Junior has always been closer to his mother, which I accepted. He's the kindest soul among us. And Joy, still so young, will likely be the most affected by these revelations. She'll need your strength to lean on. Be there for her. I've always adored the mountains, and I've found a peaceful place that caters to my needs, Mountain Pines Assisted Living. Everything's arranged, financially and otherwise. I want you and the kids to visit next weekend once I'm settled. I'm really looking forward to it. But before that, I'm going trout fishing with Elvis, one more time. 
taking my tent, something I haven't done for years. My final adventure, if you will. I love you, Ronnie, and all of you. See you soon. After some more emotional moments, they began asking questions. And, how long have you been in the loop? I got wind of it almost immediately after he did. He caught me off guard by visiting my place. Once we got comfortable, he handed me a hundred dollar bill. What's this about? And, I need your professional help. Usually, I would ask my son-in-law, but this matter is extremely private, and I don't want the family to know. Can you assist me? I had reservations, but I consented. It turned out to be as challenging as I feared. You could see the emotional toll it took on me by my tear-streaked face when I returned home night after night. Assisting him deepened my respect for him. He was grappling with daunting prospects, yet his foremost concern was to shield his family from hardship. Not all his plans sat well with me, and I managed to dissuade him from some. But his resolve was clear. You made one thing clear, don't disclose anything to your mother or siblings until he gives the go-ahead. He wanted you to be prepared for what's coming. It's getting late, and you have a lot to process. Visit us Saturday evening. We'll have a barbecue, and my husband will handle the grilling, he's quite the chef. Then we can go over the documents. Monday evening. That Monday, three days before Anne's meeting with his daughter Ronnie, David Childers sat in his cherished, albeit aged, recliner. It was too comfortable to part with, even if his wife complained. He gazed at his wife, his partner of 31 years. She felt his stare and looked up, slightly irritated. What is it? She asked, her voice tinged with her usual exasperation. Just reflecting on our 31 years together, quite the journey in today's world. Do you ever regret choosing me, a simple farmer, over your other suitors? Especially Ed. He seemed tailor-made for a suit and tie, probably never got his hands dirty. Her eyes narrowed slightly, pausing before she replied. No regrets about choosing you. Sure, I sometimes wished you'd dress up more, take me out more, but that's in the past. I chose you, and I don't regret it. He continued probing. Are you certain? I haven't been much of a partner lately, what with my illness. It's been tough on us. You don't miss our more intimate moments. She shifted, clearly uncomfortable with the topic. Let's just say, I now prefer a nice dinner out over a night of drinks and dancing. We're in our 60s, after all, those days are behind us. He smiled, reassured. Thanks, dear, that really means a lot. He shifted the topic. Sweetheart, can I ask a favor of you? She was a bit hesitant due to their previous chat and didn't agree immediately. What is it? He gave a reassuring smile. It's the start of trout season. I'm planning to take Elvis and stay overnight at the state park. Could you prepare some of your pimento cheese and brownies for me to bring along? Somehow, I feel like I fish better when you do that. She gave a warm smile. Of course. Are you sure you're up for the trip? He had managed to keep his health issues from her, pretending everything was fine, often attributing his forgetfulness to sleep problem and insomnia. He even started sleeping in another room, claiming it was to avoid disturbing her sleep with his restlessness, to which she didn't object. On the evening of May 14th, Ronnie, Phil, Anne, and her husband Jerry were on the patio, enjoying the late spring air as they waited for the barbecue. Conversation was sparse, each lost in their own thoughts. Anne fetched another round of beers and relaxed back into her chair. Have you seen the DVDs? Ronnie, attempting to stay strong, quickly succumbed to tears. Yes. After discussing it, Phil and I had Junior, his wife Jane, Joy, and her roommate Sydney over last night. I showed them the main DVD, followed by their individual ones, after previewing them myself as instructed. Joy was overwhelmed and ended up in the hospital early this morning, treated for severe distress and a breakdown. Junior was silent at first, then furiously denied everything, claiming it was all fabricated. Jane had to take him home and later told me she had to give him a sedative, as he was still upset and restless throughout the night. I doubt she slept at all. Anne hadn't anticipated that she would share the videos so soon, but the timing felt right and everything was in order. Phil had seen them and praised her efforts, expressing gratitude and acknowledging the delicate situation it would have created had he taken it upon himself. He was visibly moved as he spoke about the video. I never realized how much my father-in-law appreciated me, he said, emotion in his voice. He expressed his gratitude for the way I've been a supportive husband and father, and he apologized for the difficult situations we faced. It saddened me deeply, and I wish I had spent more time with him. He emphasized how crucial it is for Ronnie and me to be pillars of strength for our family. And, I want to thank you. I realize this was a lot to ask, and we'll try to limit such demands in the future. Jerry, a man of few words, stood beside Anne, deeply shaken by the extent of the deception he had uncovered. Remember, if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to reach out. No matter the time or day, just call. It's too much to handle alone, he assured her. Anne embraced him tighter, feeling thankful for the person he was. Now that the truth is out in the open, what's the next step, Ronnie? Anne inquired. Ronnie straightened, her frustration becoming apparent. Not everyone is aware yet. Our mother is going to be shocked soon. Tomorrow, as a family, we plan to visit Dad in his care home, to see if he wants to share anything more, and to show him love. He needs our support now more than ever. On the morning of Saturday, May 14, 2011, David was awakened by a gentle pull on his sleeve. Okay, Elvis, I'm up. 
It's way too early for a seti, but you're right, we can't keep the trout waiting. Just give me a moment to get breakfast started. He got out of bed, appreciating the frame he had purchased for his air mattress, which made rising much easier. Sitting up, he paused, his head in his hands, recalling the troubling episode from the previous night when he found himself disoriented in the forest, unsure of the way back to the campsite. Without Elvis's guidance, he feared he would still be lost. The incidents seemed to be happening more often. In silence, he prepared breakfast, while Elvis kept an eye on the bacon, watchful and attentive. After tidying up, he packed his lunch and fishing equipment into his small bag, grabbed his fishing rod, and glanced at Elvis. Today's the day I catch the big one at Baker's Point, Elvis. I can feel it. Ready to set off. Elvis, brimming with excitement, took the lead. Friday night, Sydney clasped Joy's hand tightly for comfort. Take it easy, babe. It's probably just a minor issue. Joy clung to Sydney, seeking solace in her presence. I can't shake this feeling. What if it's bad news? What if they find out about us and disapprove? Keeping this secret is overwhelming. Sydney sighed, recalling their repeated discussions. Remember, telling my mom last year went smoother than we thought. Sure, she had hopes for grandchildren, but she's fond of you and was supportive of our plan to adopt after settling into our careers. Her expression grew stern. And if anyone disapproves, we'll deal with it. But honestly, it's not the big secret you think it is. I suspect your dad knows, even if he hasn't mentioned it, and your siblings probably have an inkling too. You're the only one fretting over this. Just relax, I doubt this meeting has anything to do with that. She later wished her reassurances had been accurate. Junior and Jane had arrived early, and they began eating, curious about the urgent family gathering. Ronnie, avoiding their inquiries during dinner, surprised everyone afterwards by embracing each of them. She then pulled Junior and Joy close, looking intently at them. I need to show you something that's going to be tough to watch. I can't make it any less painful, but what I can promise is that no matter what, I'm here for you, because I love you so much. She showed the video first, and soon, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Ronnie handed Joy her video, suggesting she watch it in the privacy of their eldest daughter's room. As per her dad's wishes, she had watched all the DVDs provided. Only a few minutes passed before a heart-wrenching scream echoed through the house, prompting everyone to rush upstairs. They found her in a state of utter distress, inconsolable. It was necessary to call for medical help. She was treated for extreme emotional distress, sedated, and had to stay in the hospital overnight. After confirming there was nothing more they could do, they returned to Ronnie's place. The hospital staff reassured everyone she would likely wake by morning. Sydney decided to stay by her side. Junior remained in his niece's room long after the video finished, frozen in place. Eventually, Jane came to escort him away, her guidance gentle and patient. She assured him they would visit the hospital first thing in the morning, and she intended to watch her video at home. By then, it was nearly dawn, and Ronnie and Phil barely made it to bed before collapsing from exhaustion. Said a morning, Sydney was half asleep when Joy came to. Confused, she tried to piece together the events that led her there. She checked herself for injuries but found none. Touching the locket her dad had given her brought everything rushing back. Her cries woke Sydney, who immediately enveloped her in comfort, asking the medical staff for some privacy. Once the rest of the family arrived, they each took turns offering their support until she calmed down. She requested some time alone with Ronnie, and after a heart-to-heart, -heart, Joy announced she'd be staying with Sydney and her mom that night. They all agreed to reunite at Junior's place the next day to visit their father. Hearing about David, Sydney's mom embraced Joy tightly, expressing her sorrow for the man who was the epitome of silent strength, a solid, reliable presence that made everyone feel secure. Said afternoon, Jane observed her husband with an unusual intensity, taken aback by his silence. Normally lively and boisterous, his quietude was uncharacteristic. She sought comfort by caressing her belly, where their unexpected joy, a baby girl, was growing, already bringing happiness at just five months along. This baby was a beautiful surprise for Jane, who was 36 and already a mother to two boys. The love the boys had for their grandfather made the impending news even more difficult to bear. She had always been fond of her father-in-law, unlike her mother-in-law, who seemed aloof and unapproachable. The children gravitated towards their grandfather, while she and Ronnie often tried to engage the grandmother in conversation, to little avail. She quietly hoped that he would stand up to her after years of cold treatment, though she never expressed this aloud. After all, he had always been particularly attached to his mother. Jane certainly didn't want to get involved in the drama. When the children returned from their other grandparents, they were greeted with an unexpectedly tight embrace. Wow, Dad, you're acting like it's the end of the world. Everything okay? Junior asked, breaking the silence. No, son, he replied, tousling his oldest hair, despite the boy's discomfort with the gesture. I just received some upsetting news, and I'm still trying to make sense of it. He then turned and embraced Jane so tightly she was lifted off the ground, showing a glimpse of normalcy after a long day. Yet, Jane felt apprehensive about the future, especially her fear of nursing homes. Said a morning 5 14 11. 
Baker's Point, named after an early settler whose family once owned the land, had been under state ownership for 40 years, transformed into a park and campground offering hiking, swimming, boating, and fishing. The point itself was a narrow granite outcrop extending into the water no more than three feet wide, dropping off sharply about 90 feet to the river below. The river ran swiftly, its bed a mix of small and large stones, before curving at the point and forming a large pool. David, having climbed up from the pool to the point, was catching his breath. Gosh, Elvis, I remember when I could run up here without getting winded. Elvis gave him a look that seemed almost like a smile, and David noticed it. Don't think it slipped my mind. What were you thinking? I nearly had it, must have been a 15-pounder. That's a giant for this place. I didn't plan on keeping it, just wanted to feel its weight once before setting it free. It was nearly in the net when you leaped into the water and snapped the line. He glanced at Elvis, feeling a sense of admiration. The dog wasn't flawless, with a misaligned tooth causing his lip to twist into a snarl, reminiscent of a young Elvis Presley, which inspired his name. Elvis was the heftiest from the last group of boxers he raised, tipping the scales at over 70 pounds. Catching his breath, he prepared two small bowls, filled one with water and the other with canned dog food, a special treat amidst the usual dry fare. He fastened the long leash to Elvis's collar, tying the other end to a nearby tree, providing just enough slack. As he unwrapped his sandwich, Elvis nudged him, trying to get closer. He sighed as Elvis eyed his meal with a soft whimper. Seriously, Elvis, I spoil you with premium food, and here you are, eyeing my last sandwich. How is that fair? Yet, he shared half of the sandwich with him. There you go, buddy. It's the least I can do to say sorry and thanks. Sorry for leaving you alone for two days without food or water. And thanks because when I finally showed up, your first instinct was just to be happy to see me. That made me face the truth and take action. He paused to scratch Elvis's favorite spot behind his ears. Ever wonder why I chose you from the litter? You weren't the prettiest, and certainly not the sharpest, but you had an unwavering loyalty. Whether it was freezing cold or scorching hot, you were always ready to follow me anywhere. After a final pat, he reassured Elvis, don't worry, someone will come soon. You've got food and water, and your bark will surely get attention. Farewell, my loyal friend. He lingered a moment longer, tears streaming down his face. Standing at the edge, he was taken back to the events of the morning. He had made his way to the very tip of the cliff, gazing down at the daunting 90-foot drop. Below, the river's source meandered alongside the cliff base, cascading down a 10-foot descent over an 80-foot course, its path littered with stones ranging from small orbs to boulder-sized giants, before bending into a deep, serene pool. 90 feet seemed sufficient. He mulled over his meticulously laid plans, seeking any oversight. For his children's sake, it was imperative that his actions appeared accidental. The cheerful recordings he left behind would bolster the illusion of an unintended mishap. He felt a strange urge to vocalize his thoughts. In all honesty, I've never been overly concerned about spirituality. I escorted my children to church, feeling it was important they understand your presence. But in those gatherings, I never truly sensed your essence, perhaps overshadowed by the multitude of others. Yet, I encountered you in the simplicity of nature, in the breeze, the nurturing sunshine and rain that fostered my crops, in the unsung beauty of the fields destined to sustain unseen faces, and, occasionally, in the innocent expressions of my children. For these gifts, I am grateful. I acknowledge my next step might be seen as misguided by some. Part of me pursues this path for personal reasons, as the thought of a prolonged decline is unbearable. However, my primary motive is to spare my children the agony of witnessing my gradual dissolution to a mere vestige. I aim to leave them with memories of vitality, to avoid the torment of obligatory visits to a diminishing presence. Perhaps my decision is flawed, even selfish, but I am resolved. It's time I made peace with it. He paused, allowing himself a brief smile. And if you're inclined, a final favor, let me snag the big one. I promise to release it, savoring the moment as a fond farewell. On a sunny Saturday afternoon, Hank and Mary Travers labored breathlessly to keep pace with their exuberant 12-year-old daughter, who darted joyfully along the trail. Originating from the bustling city, they had sought a tranquil small-town life, yearning for a nurturing environment for their child and a home surrounded by spacious greenery. Beth was their belated joy, a dream fulfilled after years of hopeful anticipation. They developed a passion for nature and became avid campers, sharing tales of their early mishaps at gatherings. Yet they grew so skilled that they were often asked to accompany Beth's Girl Scout troop on their annual excursions. Beth was alerted by distant barking long before the dog came into view. Reaching the trail's crest, she spotted a large dog, ensnared by its chain under a tree, while an elderly man sat nearby, seemingly oblivious to the noise. Sensing something amiss, she awaited her parents' arrival. Upon their approach, Beth approached the man, gently rousing him with concern. Sir, sir, are you okay? He seemed unresponsive at first, then abruptly stirred, focusing on the young girl. Beth, feeling his gaze, repeated her inquiry. Her recollection of his response lingered, especially during mountain visits. No, dear, I'm not well. Could your parents assist me back to the campsite? 
And, could you free my dog, Elvis, so he can stretch? Don't worry, he's friendly, he might just shower you with licks. With her father's approval, Beth unchained Elvis, who, relieved, dashed down the trail, releasing his energy. Despite her calls, the old man reassured her, confident of Elvis's return. Assisting the frail man to his feet proved challenging. Her father recommended walking to ease his stiffness. The man slowly ambled to the lookout, contemplating the view. David found himself at the same lookout, gazing at the waters below and then skyward, pondering the day's events. He mused to himself, resignedly acknowledging a higher plan. As he started back, a commotion arose, Elvis, racing up the trail, joyfully reunited with his owner, causing a startling mishap. Fortunately, Beth was preoccupied with the leash and missed the scene. She promptly dialed emergency services, and soon rangers and medical teams arrived, but it was too late. David looked upwards as he fell, his eyes wide with surprise. In that fleeting moment, he managed to express a silent thank you. With his final ounce of strength, he pushed Elvis into the pool. Elvis emerged, immediately scampering back to David, covering his face with licks and whimpering. It took the rangers several hours and tranquilizers to dissuade him from standing guard over David. Sunday morning, Juanita Childers entered her home, beaming with joy. She had just returned from a delightful evening with her younger companion, making ambitious plans for their life together post her separation from David and securing a substantial portion of his wealth. Retirement for her and a career change for him seemed imminent. Their liaison had stretched over two decades. Reflecting on David, her expression turned pensive. His naive and trusting nature meant he remained oblivious to her extramarital activities. Her infidelity began shortly after their marriage, initiating with their banker and evolving through various discreet encounters until she met Josh. The impending revelation would devastate David, akin to an unimaginable betrayal. Yet, as Josh often remarked, in every game, someone must lose. Noticing her answering machine blinking frantically with 30 messages, she found it peculiar. This prompted her to activate her cell phone, only to discover a flood of notifications. Most messages were from Ronnie and Phil, whose presence she increasingly questioned in her life. The final message, Phil's voice urgent, caught her attention. Juanita, you need to contact me or Ronnie immediately. David was involved in a serious accident yesterday. Please head to Highlands Medical as soon as possible and inform us when you receive this message. Her concern spiked, not out of love, but from a reluctance to see David harmed. She hastily dialed Ronnie, only to be greeted with an outburst revealing her secret was out. Where have you been? Engaged with Josh Randall. Get here now. Shaken, Juanita feared her actions were now exposed to David. She hurriedly contacted Josh as she left, urging caution and discretion, particularly with his phone. The urgency to understand the full scope of the situation and manage the fallout became her immediate focus. She could sense the urgency bordering on panic in his tone. She can't find out now. It would ruin everything. Call me back the moment you can. After hanging up, she realized he hadn't inquired about David. A troubling thought crossed her mind. If something fatal happened to David, their plans would accelerate, leaving her with all his wealth, not just a portion. She arrived at the hospital and glanced at her reflection in the car mirror, regretting not changing her attire. She was still in her evening dress, complete with elegant stockings and black high heels, items she kept hidden in a spare room. She maintained her fitness and appearance diligently, looking significantly younger than her years. Ronnie was waiting in the lobby, her expression a mix of fury and sorrow, offering no greeting. She scrutinized her mother's outfit, her expression hardening further. Finally decided to show up, Cinderella. Enjoy the gala last night. Or were you too busy competing for most scandalous? Juanita recoiled, feeling a slap might be imminent. Watch your language, young lady. How dare you talk to me that way? Ronnie surveyed her from head to toe. Well, mom, if those heels are any indication, you seem dressed for the part. Feeling her cheeks burn, Juanita was taken aback as Ronnie loudly berated her, drawing unwanted attention. She tried to grasp Ronnie's arm, but she jerked away. Don't you dare touch me. In a moment of distress, Juanita slapped her, immediately regretting the act. Ronnie, touching her cheek, regained her composure. Thanks for that. No need to broadcast our issues to everyone. Let's go. Phil was right beside her, his gaze so intense it could pierce through steel. Juanita could sense the fury radiating from him. Together, they proceeded down a corridor to a cramped office, pausing at the entrance. Step inside. They have updates on Dad's condition, something you seem to ignore, given you've yet to ask about it, he said tersely, pushing her into the room. Inside, Juanita encountered a woman who seemed worn and frazzled. She glanced up from her cluttered desk. How can I assist you? Please, have a seat. Juanita sat down carefully, recalling the previous night with a hidden smile. She had given Josh a rare indulgence, which had left her a tad uncomfortable. It was a rare concession that seemed to keep their relationship in check. Juanita focused back on the woman, saying, I need to know about David Childers. What's his status? When can I see him? I was away last night and missed the messages. I came as soon as I heard. The woman sifted through her documents, then dialed a number, looking concerned. 
Shortly after, a doctor entered, both wearing uneasy expressions. Mrs. Childers, it seems there's been a mix-up. Your husband isn't here at the hospital, the doctor began reluctantly, disliking the news he had to deliver. I regret to inform you that your husband died yesterday afternoon in a hiking mishap, as per the reports. Your daughter has arranged for his transportation to the local funeral home. I assumed the children had informed you they were all here by last night. Juanita gasped softly, sinking into her chair. The doctor quickly checked on her, then called a nurse to locate her family. The nurse returned with a cold note from Ronnie. You didn't need us when he was alive, there's no need for us now. Perhaps you should seek comfort from Josh. However, Junior is in the lobby, waiting for you. Jane took their car home. That was the end of it. Junior drove her home in silence, ignoring her attempts at conversation. Jane was there, waiting outside, but she didn't come in. Juanita took note of that. Forget them all. They'll all be looking to me with open hands once the will is revealed. I'll be interested to see how their attitudes change then. Thursday afternoon. It was a funeral that the small town would remember for years. David was beloved, and the small church was packed to the brim. Everyone recalled the visitation, where Juanita sat encircled by the older grandchildren, while the siblings grouped on the opposite side. The attendance line was extensive, and the atmosphere heavy with grief, until Josh Randall entered, embraced Juanita, and moved towards the children. Joy erupted in fury. How dare you show your face here? Leave now, or I will reveal everything. Josh's face flushed deep red, and he left swiftly. It took three men to hold back Junior. Juanita collapsed. The same unusual division was noted at the funeral. Juanita traveled in a limousine with the three eldest grandchildren, while the siblings and their partners shared another limousine. Sydney walked Joy to the limo door and then turned to leave, but Junior blocked his path. Where do you think you're going? You're part of the family now, and Joy needs you. Come, sister-in-law, join us. Sydney wept throughout the journey to the cemetery, torn between grief and relief. Update. Juanita sat pondering. Why were the children acting so harshly? Didn't they understand she deserved some joy too? She was compiling a to-do list and found it strange that she couldn't locate the necessary documents in his office. Panic set in when she discovered the bank's safety deposit box was empty. She had longed for his grandmother's jewelry, which he only took out on rare occasions, and she had hoped to wear it often. She reassured herself quietly, believing Phil must be aware of the situation. She anticipated the revelation at the will reading, eager to prove a point to those overconfident children. The will's disclosure was set for the following day. Josh had covertly visited the night before, their time together stretched into several delightful hours. They reveled in each other's company, with the night bringing profound rest for her. Sitting carefully, she reflected on how their relationship had evolved, with him increasingly expressing his affection in assertive ways, which she oddly found appealing. He had left subtle marks on her, a secret sign of their connection. Once the will's contents were revealed and their respective situations resolved, they planned to start afresh elsewhere. Monday afternoon. Juanita approached Ann Johnson's office with an unusual bounce in her step. It struck her as peculiar that Phil wasn't managing the will, but she rationalized it as a measure to prevent any conflicts of interest. She was welcomed and led to a conference room where Anne, introducing herself, couldn't completely hide her contempt. Juanita was indifferent, knowing soon she'd be free from these interactions. Mrs. Childers, the will stipulates that you watch this video, which will clarify many details before we proceed to the actual reading, and explain, indicating the video would last about 30 minutes and advising her to call the receptionist when finished for the formal reading with everyone present. Left alone, Juanita pondered the situation, half-jokingly musing about her late husband's final message. Despite her feelings, she realized she missed him more than expected. His presence had brought a sense of security and comfort, now noticeably absent in the large, echoing house. She played the video, his familiar face appearing on the screen. His message started, Juanita, if you're seeing this, I'm already gone. It's been two years, and you hardly noticed my decline. But I guess you had your distractions. She felt a twinge of guilt, acknowledging her self-absorption as he spoke. Things like having an affair with Josh Randall. Did you know he's likely the father of Joy? And Junior, I'm not sure who his father is, but if you can remember, you should tell him. What I've realized from all this is that conditions like mine can be passed down genetically. This information could be crucial if he ever needs an organ transplant or something similar. She paused the recording, her heart racing. How had this been discovered? Calming herself, she pressed play again, bracing for more revelations. You might find it interesting that Ronnie is actually mine. It seems she was overlooked. All these years I've cared for you, feeling you pull away. Now it makes sense. I've always been wary of Josh, he never seemed trustworthy. Now my suspicions are confirmed. I hired a company to gather audio and photos of you two together interested in seeing some snippets. The screen showed a picture of Josh and her, too intimate, accompanied by her laughter on the audio. Can you believe they have no clue? After 20 years, they're still in the dark. I pity them, especially your wife. It'll be a shock when she receives the divorce papers. Thankfully, the kids are grown and gone. Josh's laughter followed. She'll manage. She can stay with her mother while we deal with the house and divide the assets. 
she wouldn't be able to afford it on her own. And your husband, he's the one who will be devastated. When he gets the papers demanding a large share of the assets, it'll hit him hard. Her own voice came through again. Realistically, I might end up with half, but that's still a significant amount. With your upcoming retirement and the early pension, we'll have more than enough for a comfortable life. I've always dreamed of visiting Europe, starting with Scotland. Their conversation turned more intimate, with sounds of affection and encouragement, ending with Josh expressing his excitement. She was overwhelmed, sitting there as the image on the screen shifted to a montage of her and Josh, captured in various scenes together. These scenes smoothly transitioned to her husband's face, displaying an intensity of anger she had never witnessed before. Why stay with me if you felt I was inadequate? Then it dawned on me, it was all for the financial gain, he said. Considering your high opinion of me, I felt compelled to reciprocate, he continued. The terms of my new will are watertight. You're welcome to challenge it, though you'll be wasting what little you'll have left. I've updated my insurance policies to name our children as the sole beneficiaries. You won't receive a cent from them if something happens to me. I've also taken care of funeral expenses, so you won't have to worry about that cost. I've sold most of the farm land to that persistent developer, retaining just 20 acres and the buildings. It was mine to sell, protected by a trust from my father that only I could break. Despite the developer's attempts to negotiate a lower price citing economic reason, I stood firm and secured the full asking price. I cleared out our safety deposit box, transferred all our savings, except a small sum, along with the bonds and investments to a new bank, and placed them under Ronnie's control. She'll decide if you deserve any of it. Her mind was spinning from his revelations. Considering you might find the large house too much for one, I've taken care of that. I've paid off Junior's mortgage. You'll swap places, as they need more space with a new baby on the way. His modest two-bedroom will be more than adequate for you. Consider it a favor, and don't bother fighting it. Ronnie and Anne are my executors, and they won't hesitate to remove you. This way, you can appear generous and earn some admiration. The money from selling the land has been placed into trusts for our children, to be distributed equally. It's their choice if they wish to share any with you. Rest assured, my actions are thoroughly planned and legally sound. You can try to contest them if you wish. And if you're thinking of divorcing me or attacking my finances by questioning my mental state, know that I've preemptively had myself declared incapable a year ago, with Ronnie appointed as my guardian. He paused, resting his head in his hands. When he looked up again, his eyes were filled with tears. I'm not sure why you never loved me, and I probably never will understand. However, you've given me some happy moments and three wonderful children. That's why I've left you enough to ensure you can retire comfortably. But remember, if you squander that money on frivolous things, like extravagant vacations, once it's gone, it won't be replenished. I've also made it clear that you should not visit me at the nursing home. I wish to preserve the few good memories I have. Farewell, Juanita. He paused for a moment before adding a final note. By the time I pass away, you'll have discovered some surprises I've arranged for you. I hope you accept them in the spirit they were intended. The recording ended with his expression, a mix of sorrow and frustration. Overwhelmed, she rested her head on the table, tears streaming down her face. She didn't bother attending the will reading, it seemed pointless to her. Ronnie noticed the astonished expressions of her siblings. They all had substantial assets now. With prudent management, they could ensure a prosperous future for their offspring and a comfortable retirement for themselves. Ronnie relentlessly followed the directives in the will regarding her mother. A month later, she and Junior exchanged their homes. This move made her appear considerate, and she had to confess, she appreciated the smaller house for its simplicity and ease of maintenance. Her life became more serene. On a Friday afternoon, Juanita was puzzled about her boss's request for a meeting, as she rarely summoned anyone, usually preferring to roam the building and manage on the go. Reflecting on her career, she recalled her eagerness to work after her child Joy was born, feeling idle at home. They were financially stable, but she yearned for something more. David supported her wish, understanding her need for fulfillment. Yet, with only a high school education, job options were limited. Marrying David right after turning 18 seemed like her path then. It was David who secured her position at the nursing home owned by his cousin. Starting in housekeeping, a field she found satisfaction in despite the modest income, she gradually ascended to become the head of her department. One of the perks of the job was the retirement plan. After 20 years of service, employees could retire with 75% of their salary, but only after reaching 60 years of age. Juanita had surpassed 60 and needed just 15 more months to qualify. Her retirement plans aligned with her eligibility for early retirement. She was taken aback to find Josh there. Their relationship had soured after she learned she wouldn't inherit much. Josh occasionally visited, but he no longer spoke of their future, suggesting they take a break. The dynamic between them had changed, becoming less comfortable for her. Tensions peaked during a particularly disagreeable encounter, leading to a heated argument and their eventual estrangement. Josh, what are you doing here? He responded indifferently, not sure. Was told to be here at three, so here I am. Maybe it's about our past times. 
Juanita had secured Josh his position as a groundskeeper, maintenance worker 16 years earlier. The facility had three such employees. Mona, the facility owner, summoned them to her office and closed the door. She regarded them sternly before forcefully placing a file on the desk. You fools, do you realize the risk you pose to my business? If the inspectors had discovered you engaging in inappropriate conduct in the vacant rooms, I could have lost my license. And Juanita, considering your age, what were you thinking? They were shocked, wondering how their secret was discovered. They had been discreet, coordinating their rendezvous in rooms Juanita inspected and Josh prepared for reoccupation. Their trysts, though brief, were thrilling, partly due to the risk of getting caught. Mona revealed photos from the file, unmistakably capturing their intimate moments, and informed them about the legal surveillance in the facility. She explained that she installed a camera in the room after receiving a tip, which she removed before a new resident arrived. Mona then addressed Josh, due to the economic downturn, I regret to inform you that we must let you go. I wish you luck in your future endeavors. Don't expect a recommendation from us. Josh was overwhelmed with frustration. What? This can't be happening. I've dedicated eight years here, and I'm just four years away from being fully vested. You can't just strip that away from me. Mona exhaled deeply. Very well, Josh Randall, you are being dismissed due to severe breaches of our company's ethics policy. Your file contains a signed acknowledgement of these rules, indicating your understanding and agreement to abide by them. You are required to vacate the premises immediately. And Josh, somehow, these photographs will reach your wife. Are you sure you don't prefer the layoff option? Josh slumped, a picture of defeat. Fine, I'll take the layoff. Mona's lips curved in a thin smile. Good decision. At least you'll have some financial support from unemployment benefits while you search for new employment. Now, please leave and do not return. Is that clear? He nodded, exiting silently. Juanita remained seated, her anxiety palpable. Mona's voice was cold and sharp. Juanita, you've made a grave mistake. I considered terminating your employment when David brought me those photographs. Although reluctant to install the camera, it was ultimately about protecting my interests. You should be grateful David didn't push for your dismissal. His approach actually increased my respect for him. She leaned back, fixing Juanita with a stern gaze. Juanita Childers, due to recent events, you are being stripped of your supervisory role and reduced to part-time status. You are now assigned to work only Fridays and Saturdays, which helps us cover the most challenging shifts. You retain your employment, and I secure dependable weekend support. Juanita, overcome with emotion, started to cry as Mona emphatically placed the folder on the table. If this arrangement doesn't suit you, you're free to walk away. However, consider this, by accepting, you can retain your employment and continue working towards your pension. Yes, your hours will reduce from 40 to 16 weekly, which means it'll extend your time until pension eligibility to age 67, but it's not like you have extravagant travel plans imminent, right? Decide now, Juanita. We need your decision immediately. Juanita felt cornered and ultimately consented. Mona sensed a twinge of sympathy for her. It's not all bad. You can still look forward to retirement next year and keep working. Your salary won't affect your pension benefits. If you stay on good terms, I might increase your hours in about a year. Excerpts from the farewell recordings. Joy. His expression was joyful as he filled the screen. Joy, Joy, did I ever explain your name's origin? It's because you brought me double the happiness I ever expected during my later years. While your mother named our other children, I was adamant about naming you Joy Elizabeth, in tribute to your great-grandmother, whom I wished you had met. You've been a blessing to me. Having you felt like receiving a second chance at fatherhood, especially with Ronnie being so much older. You've consistently lived up to your name, lifting my spirits whenever I was down. It was hard for me when you left for college, but it was your time to forge your own path. His demeanor became earnest. Joy, joy, there's something vital you must grasp. Regardless of any external opinions or results, you are my cherished daughter, forever. If there's one thing you should believe from all I've said, it's that my love for you is profound. He took a moment before continuing. And on the topic of love, dear, it's clear to everyone that you're gay. Even your brother, as oblivious as he can be, noticed it. I realized that when you were 13 and discovered you hiding magazines not meant for your age in the barn. It was evident when you and Sydney attended prom together, uninterested in bringing boys, and even bought each other corsages. It didn't surprise me when you both chose the same college and lived together, ostensibly needing two bedrooms, yet you converted one into a study. So, there's no need to hide any longer, come out when you're ready, and we'll pretend to be surprised, if that makes it easier for you. He casually mentioned not to be shocked if her mother reacts poorly. On another note, I'm pleased that Sydney chose economics as her field of study. It's good she's aware of the financial support I'm providing. Artists, while talented, often don't focus much on financial management. I'm genuinely happy you're pursuing art. Your work is exceptionally expressive, capturing emotions vividly. Do you recall the pencil drawing you did of us walking in the field with my two boxers when you were just 10? That piece confirmed your artistic potential for me. Shortly after, I arranged for your art lessons. I've displayed that drawing prominently in my office. 
It's so special to me that I've decided it should accompany me in my final journey, along with the baseball junior hit for the championship and Ronnie's first place science fair award. You kids make me incredibly proud. She found it too emotional to continue reading. Jane, I have a favor to ask. Please look out for Junior. He's always been closer to his mother, and I worry about the influence she may have over what I leave to both of you. You should be settling into our family home by now. My grandfather built it, and I've maintained and improved it over the years. It's a place filled with joy and the echoes of children's laughter. I'm aware of the recent challenges you both faced, with your job loss and his reduced work hours. Here's my suggestion. There should be enough funds for you to complete your education. If you do, Ronnie might offer you a position, or possibly a partnership. Junior has a knack for mechanics. Encourage him to pursue diesel mechanics training. The field is stable, and he wouldn't need to travel overnight. I've prepared one of the farm sheds for him. He just needs to finish his training. There's always a demand for a skilled mechanic. I would like Bobby to have my truck. It may be a bit aged, but it's well-maintained and hasn't been driven much. He's nearing the age for driving, after all. Little Dave should get the farm machinery, he's always had a knack for agriculture. I've left you enough land for him to try his hand at farming, to see if he enjoys it. And please, give him Alvis too. That dog may not be the sharpest, but he's steadfast and has always been good with Dave. I regret that I won't be around to watch them grow up. Please promise me, with all your heart, that when your daughter arrives, you'll bring her to visit me. I wish you a fulfilling life and ask that you look after our family. And please, avoid naming your daughter Davida. It just doesn't sound right to me. Sydney, I managed to make Joy face reality. Please take good care of her. She needs your love and guidance, especially with practical things like finances. Since you tend to take the lead, the responsibility largely falls on you. And Sid, I'm happy she met you. I wish you both a wonderful life. And make time to visit me alone, Sid, so we can build our friendship. Two years later, the campsite was bustling with eight adults, seven children, and ten tents, resembling a lively nomadic group. The morning was spent making an endless amount of pancakes and sausage, with the adults cooking and the children eagerly helping to clean up afterward. The younger kids played by the creek under careful supervision, while the teenagers set off to mingle with others their age. After a simple lunch, the group started packing their gear, forming a line to head up the hill, pace so the little ones could keep up. An 18-month-old girl was lovingly passed from one adult to another when they needed a break. Reaching Baker's Point after 40 minutes, they faced a safety wall, standing 42 inches high, with caution signs. A plaque near the end read, in memory of David, who tragically passed here on April 14th. His children honor him with this tribute. Rest in peace, Dad. Two small tents were promptly set up, creating a lively atmosphere among the guests. Shortly after, the melodic sounds of a string quartet filled the air, leading into the wedding march five minutes later. Joy emerged from one tent, Sydney from another, both adorned in matching white dresses and carrying similar bouquets. They approached the improvised altar, accompanied by Ronnie, Jane, and their daughters on one side, and Phil, Jr., and his sons, along with the preacher's young boys, on the other. The preacher and his wife awaited at the altar. The ceremony commenced as the music faded. The legalization of same-sex marriage in their state two months prior had led to this moment, meticulously planned to accommodate everyone's availability. At the query, who gives this woman in marriage? Joy turned towards a portrait placed beside her and said with serene assurance, my father does. Throughout her distinguished career as an artist, whenever asked about her magnum opus, she would refer to portrait of me and my father. The artwork depicted a serene blue sky over a meticulously plowed field, where a young blonde girl, about six years old, gazed up adoringly at the man whose hand she held. Her simple white dress bore the playful marks of the outdoors, contrasting with the man's rugged attire and warm smile under the bright sun. Two playful dogs added life to the scene. Despite receiving three awards and numerous purchase offers for the painting, she could never bring herself to sell it. Post-ceremony, amidst the packing up, Ronnie, Phil, Joy, Sydney, Jane, and Junior, carrying a small cooler, strolled to the peninsula's edge. They scattered flower petals into the water below, while their partners observed and then shared embraces, marking the moment before returning. Elvis, the dog, eagerly anticipated the trek back, restrained by little Dave, now towering over others, as he tried to soothe the restless pet, whispering, I know, Elvis, we all miss him. Three months later, Juanita discovered the truth inadvertently revealed by a grandchild. Since the funeral, Joy had ceased communication with her. This narrative stems from an actual event. I had a buddy who relocated far away, and over time, our conversations dwindled until they ceased. Five years later, he surprisingly called me, explaining he stumbled upon my number while sifting through old contacts. We exchanged pleasantries briefly before he disclosed his real motive. He was battling a severe illness and was reaching out to old friends to bid farewell while he still had the strength. We reminisced about the past for half an hour until he ended the call. I promised myself I'd ring him again, and after three weeks, I did, only to have his wife answer. She regretfully informed me that he had passed away in a tragic mishap while fishing. 
He had accidentally fallen into the river and his gear weighed him down, leading to his demise. This news was particularly unsettling because my friend had a deep-seated fear of water, stemming from a near-drowning incident in his youth. Even driving over bridges made him uneasy. Make of that what you will. My comment, I personally haven't had to deal with a person with advanced Alzheimer's but have been around people who were probably in the early stages. Forgetting things even people you should know must be about the worst thing there is knowing at some point you will most likely lose all your memories of who you were, the people you loved and who loved you. It can't be easy to live with knowing it's coming.